Let me start the video, okay. So we're going to take the point groups that we learned about last time uh, in the last section of the course, and we're going to apply that to the motions of the molecule. And I kind of talked a little bit about that um, as we were prepping for the exam, but we'll really expand upon that in this next section of the course. So we've already looked at Lewis dot structures and hybridization theory to get a, a, an idea of a three-dimensional geometry. And once we have that, then we can go through the flow chart and determine the point group of the molecule. Now, in most PCHEM courses, that's taught. Uh, it's also taught in inorganic courses a lot of time. Uh, but it, it almost seems like a, a game of trivia. In, in, in every other university and in the university that I attended as my undergrad and then when I went to graduate school, we, you know, we all learned point groups and group theory, but we never used it. We used it to label maybe some energy levels on occasion, but we never, we never used it until I got to late in my graduate school days and I realized why symmetry was important. So once we are able to find the symmetry and we know the character table for a molecule, we can determine the symmetries of the molecular motions. Every motion in the molecule has a particular symmetry. And every electron cloud, the way they shake, like a pi bond, the way it oscillates, in space has a particular symmetry. And that's what governs its interaction with light. So light is an oscillating wave, and vibrations are oscillating waves, and electron clouds oscillate as waves. And so it's the interaction of these waves that's too complicated to solve by hand, but very easy to do by symmetry, if you get the point group right, if you have the right character table. So that's why that's emphasized, and then we'll use it now. So that's what we're going to do today, is to assign the symmetries that we've got the molecule, it has a point group, which row of the character table is assigned to each motion in the molecule. So let's start with water, it's pretty easy. So here's the character table. The character table is actually this left piece, okay? It's C2V, that's for water. You see the four symmetry elements across the top, and, and so this is the point group. The, 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 the word for that is the Schoenflies notation, after the person that... that I don't know why they named it after him, but that's uh, shown, please, as a person's name. Uh, this is another person's name, Millikan. So the Millikan notation for the irreducible representations. And then the, the characters are inside the character table. Now, you can look at those plus ones and minus ones. And, and for a simple character table like this one, it's pretty easy to understand. So if you look at the E... C2 and reflection planes, uh, the plus ones and minus ones can be thought of as, let's take a, a molecular orbital with the different colors. Like if you rotate it and the colors change places, then it would be a minus one under the C2. If you rotate it and the colors don't change, then it's a plus one under C2. So those plus ones and minus ones can really be helpful when you're looking at trying to pick a row in the character table for a particular orbital. Uh, also, if you're doing vibrations, and we'll look at this today, if the, if the arrow of that vibration changes direction when you rotate it, then it's a minus one. If the arrow doesn't change direction when you rotate it, then it's a plus one. So we can use those characters to sometimes to help us out. This stuff over here on the right is the Cartesian and rotational basis functions. So we see X, Y, and Z are Cartesian functions, but we also see combinations of them that are second order x squared, y squared, x, y, y, z, x, z. And those second order ones uh, we will use to determine Raman selection rules. So if you think about Raman, it's a two photon process. So a photon comes in and exits. So you have two waves. You have the, the oscillation of the incoming photon and the oscillation of the outgoing photon. Now, if both oscillations are on the z axis, so it's coming in, oscillating on the z-axis, and it leaves oscillating on the z-axis. Maybe at some other angle, but still it's oscillating on the z-axis. Both of them are z, so it's z squared. But maybe the photon comes in, interacts with the vibration that rotates that electric field, and it leaves on the y-axis. So that would be the y-z combination. Or it leaves on the x-axis. That would be the x-z combination. So any combination of those two Cartesian coordinates uh, would be a Raman exper uh, experience, a scattering. And so that's, that's why we put Raman on this column sometimes. And it has all the, the second order combinations of the photons. X, Y, Z uh, can be the Cartesian coordinates. 
but it can also be the oscillating electric field of light. It can come in and be absorbed if it's oscillating on X or on Y or on Z. Absorption and emission would be in this, in this column. And RZ, RX, and RY, those are your three rotational degrees of freedom. So the rotation of the molecule has a particular symmetry. And so that's what RX, RY, and RZ stand for. So pretty much everything a molecule can do and how it interacts with nature is in this, this column, these columns on the right. Now this top row is the only one that's even. You know, in our particle in a box, we had even and odd. It was easy to look at the wave function because it was just a one-dimensional wave function. So we could look at it and say, yeah, if I go to the left and it's positive, if I go to the right, it's positive, that's an even function. If I go to the left, it's positive, if we go to the right and it's negative, that's an odd function. Easy to see in one dimension, not so easy to see for a complicated molecule for an electron cloud or maybe a motion, a vibrational motion but we can be confident that the top row is the only one that is even. Everything else is odd. So if, if we're taking these motions and multiplying by light and multiplying by an excited state motion, we may end up with multiple components. You know how if you multiply trigonometric functions, sometimes you, get, uh, you have to do a substitution and you end up with two or three integrals, okay? One of those functions may be even, and the others may be odd. So those other integrals may be zero, but you still have a non-zero integral. And so that's what's being shown here with the pluses. After we multiply all of these functions together, we may end up with many symmetries inside our integral. <clears throat> and all it takes for that integral to be non-zero is for one of those smaller integrals to be even. And so in this case, you see that has an A1 right there. That's top row. And so this is not equal to zero. The B2 piece is zero. The B1 piece would be zero. The A2 piece would be zero. But if it has A1 anywhere in it, then the overall integral will be non-zero. And then anything that is not top row is odd symmetry. And so integrals of B A2, B1, or B2 would be zero. So that's a very helpful result. Anything I can clear up about this before we start applying it to water? I'll try to be precise in my language whenever I say if the contents of the integral contain the top row, as opposed to saying if the contents of the integral are the top row, right? So if the top one here, this, this one, the only thing I have is the top row symmetry, but it could also just be that it contains the top row symmetry. So the next one has lots of parts, but it does contain one part that is the top row, and so it will be non-zero. Okay. So let's apply this to, to water. So water has three atoms, and if I just have a single atom in space, it can do three things. It can translate. It can go X, Y, and Z. Okay. If I have two atoms in space, they can both translate. If they both go in the same direction, they can go in X, they can both go in Y, and they can both go in Z. So they still have those three translations, but they can also uh, rotate around each other, and they can also vibrate. Okay. So we don't ever lose any degrees of freedom, we just change what they are. When we start making molecules, we still only have three translational degrees of freedom, but then we get three rotational degrees of freedom, and then we have the balance is vibrations. And so let's looking at water, we have nine total degrees of freedom. They're all nine are shown here on the board. The top three are translations, so all three atoms are moving in space. The next three are rotations. It's kind of hard to show rotation on a static screen, um, but this is, you see this little stick here? This is the x-axis, right? So here's our coordinate system. This is the x-axis, and I show the little rotating arrow. So this is rotating around the x-axis. Here I show the y-axis, and it's rotating around y. And here I show the z-axis, it's rotating around z. And that's all you can do. The, the only time that's different is for a linear molecule. So pretend that this is a linear molecule, and I can rotate around the x-axis or the y-axis, 
but the rotating around the z-axis is not defined because I don't have, if it's linear, there is no mass off the z-axis. And so there's no moment of inertia. There's no resistance to rotation. In fact, I couldn't tell if it was rotating. So it's just not defined. The rotation around the, the linear axis of a linear molecule is just not defined. So I would only have two rotations for a linear molecule. Everybody pay attention to that one. A linear molecule only has two rotations. Our X and our Y. And we will emphasize that multiple times. So if it's not a translation and it's not a rotation, by definition it's a vibration. So that's why the vibrations is always a difference. It's 3N total degrees of freedom minus the rotations and minus the translation. So that's the minus 6 part. Everything else, that, that difference gives us the number of vibrations. So in this case, we had nine total degrees of freedom. Nine minus six is three. So here are the three vibrations in water. <clears throat> now, think about, I really wish we could build one of these in the, in the department. Uh, one of the earliest, I forget what his name was, but uh, one of the earlier researchers in vibrational spectroscopy um, he suspended atoms from the ceiling with like a like fishing wire. Okay, so he had some masses here. So for oxygen, relative to hydrogen, the oxygen would say be 16 ounces, and the hydrogen uh, mass would be one ounce. And they were all suspended from the ceiling with uh, with the filament, and then he would put a spring between them. And he found that if I stretch one OH spring and let it go. The other OH spring has the same spring constant, and I couldn't vibrate just one. If he vibrated one, the other one vibrated, and it either vibrated in phase, like this, where they both stretched together, or it vibrated out of phase, where they, they stretched opposite of each other. One shrunk while the other one stretched. So because they have the strength, same spring constant, and they have the same mass, it's two coupled pendula. And so it's a difficult physics problem is to calculate the vibrational frequency because it's not just one pendulum, which is pretty easy to calculate. It's two connected together by identical springs. And so he figured out the vibrational motions of molecules just using balls and springs. So if you're thinking about this with, with uh, like balls and springs and a harmonic oscillator, good. <laughs> okay. Even though it's a quantum system, it still behaves that kind of that that in motion of, or moment of inertia and all of that. The, the classical physics of balls and springs works really well with vibrational motion. Okay, now the spectroscopy deals with the wave function, but the the, the mass, the frequencies, and so on will follow will follow the the harmonic oscillator with balls and springs. Now the other motion that they can do is just to bend that angle where the springs don't stretch at all; they just bend. So the angle between the hydrogens and that oxygen, that's the symmetric bend. So let's look at the symmetries. The symmetries for translation are super easy. They're in the character table. So, so translation in the y direction, so if the whole molecule is moving in the y direction, that has the symmetry of B2. Super easy, right? Translation in Z, what is it? A1. And the translation in X, B1. Okay, what about rotation? So the water molecule is like this, and it's rotating around the Z axis. So where is RZ? A2. So we know those. We can just look those right up in the character table. Rotation around the Y axis would be uh, RY, and that's B1. Rotation around X would be B2. So we, in this table, we see translation, B1, B2, A1. Those are from the character table. For the rotations, our X is B2, our Y is B1, and, and Z rotation is, is A2. But where do these come from? See the Y here? Symmetric stretch, A1. How do we know that? So we have lots of arrows on the symmetric stretch and the asymmetric stretch. And so today's class is trying to teach you how to figure out the arrows, like the, the, the symmetry of vibrational motions in a molecule. So let's look at that. So these top six are super easy. This will be easy after today. Okay. 
So if you get the arrow diagram for a molecule, you should be able to figure out the, the row of symmetry in the character table for that. So you got the molecule, you got to go maybe the flow chart, get the character table, you know, point group, then the character table. And then if you have the arrows on the, on the atoms and how they're stretching, you should be able to look at, um, at how the arrows cancel and then a, compare that to the character table and determine the symmetry. So here's a pretty complicated action in the molecule. So the, the hydrogens are stretching. That's what these arrows, notice where the heads are. So the, the bond is, is lengthening over time. And then sometime later, it turns around and comes back. So it's a harmonic oscillation. Balls and springs. Okay, The bonds are springs, and this, they stretch, and they compress. Stretch and compress. Um, now, the, the molecule can't translate, because that would be translation. So if the hydrogens are stretching down, the oxygen has to go up a little bit so that the center of mass doesn't move. And then sometime later when they compress, the oxygen goes down. So it's like this. Okay, that's the best I can do. Now, can we compare this to the X, Y, or Z axis? This is how we do that. So let's look at the Z axis first. Have you ever taken vectors? Would you ever do this in high school or maybe in college? And take this vector and compare it to its components. So this has a down component and a horizontal component. So it goes down, both of them go down, and then they both go out. So we look at the y-axis, and they have a y-component too. So it goes down and out. That's what the diagonal motion is. So we're just taking this diagonal arrow, comparing it up there to the coordinate system, and we're saying the z parts go down, the, the y parts go out, but notice that this hydrogen Y part, this arrow is going out, that arrow is going out, they cancel each other. That motion cancels. Okay. But the Z part does not cancel. So what we've done is we've moved the positive charges further down the Z axis. The oxygen is more negative than the hydrogens, and it has moved up on the Z axis. What has that done? That has created a dipole moment that has gotten stronger. So a dipole moment is the separation of partial charges in a molecule. So if, you're, if you've got a molecule and its vibrational motion causes the positives and negatives to stretch and get further apart, then you're creating a bigger electric field. If those positive and negative charges get closer together, you're getting a weaker uh, electric field. Well, this is an oscillating electric field, and so is light. <laughs> So light will come in and, and will oscillate at that frequency. If, if light comes in oscillating at that frequency, then this molecule can be excited uh, in its vibrations. So that's how vibrations absorb light. So infrared light comes in at the right frequency, and this oscillating dipole absorbs that light. If the symmetries work out. Now, what symmetry do you think we need for polarized light to oscillate with this vibration? Where is this oscillation occurring in terms of X, Y, and Z? On the Z axis. So Z polarized light would interact with this. X polarized light is not interacting with an electric field along the Z axis. But Z polarized light is interacting with an electric field on the Z axis. So this, this, is, this is why the symmetry of this stretch is A1, and then light that is A1 will come in and, and excite it and can, can interact with it. So that's top row, Z, and so then we label it A1. So that's where the A1 came from for this motion. Let's do another one. And here's a picture. So that's the, it's formaldehyde, but it's the same point group, okay? And you can kind of see the oxygens kind of barely moving. The positive charges on average are going down and up, down and up, down and up. There's no change to the left and right. So that's when I say they cancel. The motion hasn't canceled, but the positive charges, you know, they're going further away from each other, but they're still positive on the left, positive on the right. So the, the positive charge left and right are not having any effect, but the positive charge up and down is absolutely changing the electric field of that molecule. And that's what light's interacting with, is the electric field. Okay, this is the symmetric bend. 
So this is the bend of that angle uh, between the HOH angle. So it's just bending like this. And, and you see that uh, we can do the component analysis again. So the Z axis, they're both going down. The horizontal axis, they're canceling. So the Y axis, the charges are canceling out. There's no change left or right to the charges, but there is a change up and down. Is it as strong as the last one? Probably not as strong. And that's where your intensities come from. So the, the intensity is proportional to the change in this dipole moment. And so if your motion doesn't change the dipole moment very much, not a very big intensity change but or absorption of intensity. But that's part of that transition dipole moment integral that we're not able to do by hand. Okay, Gaussian can do it. And Gaussian, when you calculate a vibrational frequency calculation, gives you the intensities of the vibrational transitions. So you can predict it numerically. So this, uh, again, the, the dipole moment oscillates in the Z direction for this one. We go find Z in the character table, come across to the left, we see A1, and then we label that motion A1. And that will be a skill that I want to test you on. So, you know, you'll have an arrow diagram in, your, in the exam, and you'll need to know, I probably won't do like quadruple jeopardy. Uh, I'll probably say this molecule is like a C2H molecule. <laughs> so that you can then know what character table to use. But, uh, but I may not. I may just say, here's a molecule with the arrow diagram. What is it? So you got to take the molecule, find the point group, find the character table, figure out the vibrational motions, and then compare the dipole moment to the character table and come up with the symmetry of that motion. So it's like four or five steps. Practice. That's what... the potential is the change in that dipole moment. The, the um, intensity of the transition, the more it changes, uh, and hydrogens change it a lot, right? So they're really positive charges. And so if they really move away from a negative atom, like in water, then you have a really high absorption intensity. Yeah. So let's do the asymmetric stretch. It's a little different. Okay, the Z components... The oxygen's not moving in Z, but the hydrogens are. So this one's got a charge that's going up, and that has a charge that's going down. And so the charges that are going up and down are kind of canceling out each other. Okay? But the left and right don't cancel. So both hydrogens, the positive charges, are going that way, and the oxygen, the negative charge, is going that way. So that's creating a change in the dipole moment left and right. And left and right in this coordinate system is the y-axis. So you can see the dipole moment is oscillating this way. Now this is a hugely uh, intense transition because they're, with molecule like water being symmetric along the y-axis, uh, if we change that symmetry any, then you go from a zero dipole moment to uh, like a dipole moment that goes in positive y, and then it goes back through zero and it's a dipole moment going in negative y. So that's the largest derivative when it's going from a uh, positive to negative direction. It's really flipping and flopping along the y-axis. And so that's a very intense transition. So it's along the y-axis. So we go up in the character table and find y. And come across to the left, we see that it's B2. And so that's why we label this motion B2. So it's moving along the, the uh, <coughs> y-axis. Here's the animation of the of the formaldehyde molecule, same character table. But you can see if I were to like freeze frame it when this bond is really short, then you've got a, a positive real close to an oxygen, which is kind of canceling that small dipole, but then this positive is way far away from the oxygen, which really increases that dipole. And it's, can you see that it really is just oscillating in the y direction? Like the dipole, the change in charges is going this way. And that's, that's the wave function for that vibration will have that dipole moment and light can interact. Now, which type of light would interact with this motion? X, Y, or Z polarized light? Yeah, so it would be light that's polarized like this. So if we take a snapshot of light, we would have an electric field with a positive end and a negative end. And then it would oscillate back and it would be positive on this end and negative on that end. So light oscillating in the Y direction, meaning Y polarized light, would interact with this vibration. Now, we don't always use polarized light. We don't always align our molecules. So in nature, you know, the molecule may be leaning like this, but it's going to interact with light that's going like this. 
And another molecule might be leaning like this, and it'll interact with light going like this. So we have non-polarized light and non-polarized molecules, but we're getting an idea if we were to hold the molecule still and shoot light at it, which particular light would, would, would it absorb. If it absorbs all three, then it's going to be a really strong transition because no matter what light hits it, it's going to be absorbing. But if it only absorbs one out of the three, then that would reduce the probability of it absorbing. So you can kind of get a feel, even with the symmetry selection rules, uh, if light is real picky, if the molecule is real picky about which kind of light it absorbs, it's probably going to be a, a, a weaker transition than uh, a, a motion in the molecule that's not picky at all. So, so that's vibrational motions going from the arrow diagrams to the symmetry of that motion. Okay, so... So let's look at the energy level diagram and see where these Millikan notations fit in. So up to this point, we've only really had the particle in a one-dimensional box energy level diagram, which went even, odd, even, odd, all the way, alternating up. So in vibrational motion, they also alternate, even, odd, even, odd. And so uh, here's the harmonic oscillator, potential energy function, and here are the energy levels for the harmonic oscillator. And that's the energy equation up there. This is the vibrational frequency in wave numbers. Okay. And this is the quantum number. It's, the fonts are un unfortunate. They look very similar. This is V, the quantum number. So vibrational motion, the, just to keep things straight, so if we've been using N for our quantum number, but we'll, we'll keep that for the particle in a box. For vibrational motion, we'll use V. That's convenient, right? Vibration motion, V. Okay. And so the symmetries of the vibrational wave functions alternate, just like they did in the particle in a box, between even and whatever the motion of the molecule is. So in this case, so you see the A1s, Every even quantum number has A1. Oh, and the vibrational motion starts with the quantum number zero. So V equals zero. Whereas the particle in a box, the lowest ground state was just N equals one. So vibrational motion, V equals zero is the ground state. Okay. That's the difference. Odd number quantum state wave functions match the symmetry of the motion. Do you see why I have to use that language? Because each vibration may have a different symmetry. So every vibration has its own energy level diagram. Because every vibration has maybe a different set of springs and angles and things that it's doing. Okay. So every one of those different spring stretches and so on may have a different force constant, like the springs, the way they add together, and different masses that are moving. And so they'll have a different potential energy, which means they'll have different vibrational frequencies. Okay. So there's one of these. There's three n minus six of these for every molecule. So every vibration has its own energy level diagram. So for vibration, it's top row for all the even quantum states, and then whatever the symmetry of that motion is for the odd quantum states. So for this case, uh, for the asymmetric stretch, which we just determined to be B2, we're going to have that for, for one, three, five, seven, nine, and so on. And, and again, you can always come back to this video to review, you know, if you're just like, oh, I can't remember that about the symmetry of the motion and how it fits to the energy level diagram. Come back to this video. Now, I, I jump immediately to molecular orbitals because uh, I want to emphasize that they do not follow a pattern. So, so the particle in a box followed the pattern, even odd, even odd. Vibrational motion. Follows a pattern, even, odd, even, odd. Even rotation, we'll do rotation in the future, follows a pattern, even, odd, even, odd. But molecular orbitals are crazy. The electron cloud is crazy. Okay, so there's no, there's no guarantee what the order of the symmetries are in molecular orbitals. So let's look at some of those. So this is water. So these are the shapes of the vibrations of the electron cloud in water. So we've made some sigma bonds with the OHs, and we've got the, 
the valence electrons around the oxygen, and they all combine, and this is how they combine. Don't get caught up in all of the dotted lines. It's a molecular orbital diagram, and that's the last part of this course. Okay. What I want you to focus on for now is the symmetries. A1 here, and it's A1 here again. So notice it's not alternating. And then it's B2, and then B1, and then B2 again, and then A1. So you see, there's no pattern. It's not like the vibration where it was A1, B2, A1, B2 for molecular orbitals. And I, I pound this into you because every time I get on, the, uh, on an exam and students are like using the vibrational assumption that in the, in the transition dipole moment integral, the very first one is guaranteed to be A1. In vibration, it is, but not in molecular orbitals. So if we wanted to connect, uh, if we wanted to see if the... If this transition was allowed from here, say, to here, can I, can I send an electron up here with light? This upper wave function is B2, and the lower wave function is B2. Okay, so we would set up a transition dipole moment integral, which we'll do in the next video, and determine if that transition is allowed. So let's, let's practice on where... Of determining what these symmetries are, right? So this one is A1, why? And this one is A1, why? So let's look at some of those. And this was a difficult question to answer. Um, it's one of those things that I, I look at it and I don't remember how I learned it. And that's really frustrating to, to a professor and to a student, right? <laughs> when I'm trying to teach you something and I don't remember how to teach it because I don't remember specifically how it clicked for me. So I've made this I've tried to make a little um, uh, flow chart here for you. So this Millikan notation flow chart. So y'all don't have the, the orbital on your, on your notes, but you should have the flow chart. you have the flow chart? Okay, good. All right, so we start out with some yes, no questions. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put myself at the, I'm going to stand right here, you know, in my imagination. I'm going to stand right here at the origin of that molecule, and I'm going to look at the electron cloud. So let's, let's start with the z-axis. So I look up, and according to that map, I look up and I see a green electron cloud on the left and a red electron cloud on the right, okay? And then I look down, and I still see green on the left, and I still see red on the right. And I'm looking on the z-axis. I look up in z, green left, Red right, I look down and see green left, red right. It hasn't changed, okay? So it says, is the Z plus Z the same as the minus Z? I would say yes to that. So I looked up, it was green and red, left, right, and looked down, green and red, left, right. So I would say yes, so that's gonna be Z squared, okay? If you think about the axis, if you square everything, there's no negative numbers, right? You look positive, it's positive, you look left, uh, negative, it's positive as well, because it's squared. So that would be Z squared type symmetry. If I do that on the X axis, so X is coming out of the molecule. So I look towards positive X, green on the left, red on the right. And now I don't want to turn around because that'd be rotation. I look behind me, <laughs> green on the left, red on the right. <laughs> okay, so in positive and negative X, it's the same, green left, red right. And so that's going to be X squared. Okay, so I would say, yes, it's the same x squared. But let's look at the y. So I'm standing on the origin of the molecule. I look in the positive y direction, I see green. I look in the negative y direction, I see red. It's changed. And so that means that has the symmetry of y. Okay, so then I come over here. That all feeds into the next set of questions. It says, is there a single x, y, or z symmetry? Yes, because it was z squared, it was x squared, but it was y. So I had y. So I answered yes to the y question, and it said yes, then choose the x, y, or z row of the character table. So I've determined that the symmetry of this electron cloud motion is in the y direction. Now this is easy to see if you know what the green and red represent. Do you all know when we draw an orbital and we shade one side and not the other what we're representing? It comes into that, but what do the shading mean? What is the actual, like in this case, different colors? Electronegativity? Mm -mm. No. It's, this, is, this is, 
when you check about an atom, like the sp, d orbitals, those are the spherical harmonics. What does the word harmonic mean to you? Vibrations. So these are the vibrations of a spherical shell. So if I take a spherical shell and I bang on the top with a hammer, it's going to oscillate up and down. And that oscillation, if I map it around in latitude and longitude, will look like the P orbital. So that's the oscillation of the sphere and the Z direction would be the PZ orbital. So this green and red is the oscillation of the electron cloud. So let's say that the green is expanding and the red is contracting. So it's expanding in the big Y direction and contracting in the negative Y direction. And sometime later, it goes the other direction. So look at the colors. They slosh on the Y axis. Do you see that now? When you know what the colors mean, you can see the motion of the electron cloud is Y. And so you go to the character table, it has Y symmetry. Here's a picture of it here. This is the Z, the Z one. So when you know what those colors mean, this would be a type, like a time-lapse picture of the electron cloud. What's the symmetry of this motion? Look at the axes. Where is it sloshing? Z direction. It's sloshing up and down. And then this one? Yeah. Yeah, so look at the colors. Which way are they sloshing? Pick the axis, go to the character table, you know the symmetry. It's that simple. Let yourself learn it. All right, cool. Now you know what a molecular orbital is.